just uh, let me introduce you. Sorry? Uh, let me introduce you very quickly. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, I have known uh, Pierre um, for about two years. We have worked together on, uh, on a project. Uh, so Pierre, um, he obtained his PhD in 1994 in signal processing from the University of Paul uh, Sabatier in Toulouse and um, his higher degree of research uh, from the same university in 2002. Um, and uh, he is uh, one of the principal designers of the theory of particle methods and nonlinear filtering. Uh, he has published over 110 papers um, with about uh, 11,000 citations. And he's uh, an author of two fundamental books and other books. Um, mean field uh, simulations for Monte Carlo integration, and of course the Bible of uh, uh, Feynman Kac uh, formally. Um, he is now um, first, first class research director at Enria, France, since 2007. Uh, Simmons CRM professor at Montreal Math uh, Research Center. Um, he held um, uh, many positions. Uh, for example, he was professor of applied mathematics uh, center at Ecole Polytechnic, 2011-2014, uh, professor of mathematics, um, uh, an invited professor uh, of mathematics at Purdue and Princeton universities and other universities. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to introduce you, uh, Pierre, and uh, also be happy to, to uh, listen to your presentation today on one-dimensional discrete time and simple common particle filters. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, of course, the title is a bit provocative because uh, ensemble Kanban filter are uh, used uh, in uh, data simulation for high dimensional problems. Uh, so as particle filters, but particle filters uh, seems to have some trouble in high dimensions. Beside the fact that there is a lot of work nowadays uh, by Dan, Chris, Anne, and other people uh, trying to implement particle filter in high dimensional problems using several tricks and so on. But uh, okay, so the, the, in high dimensional problem nowadays, the main tool are uh, ensemble Kanban filters. Uh, but as any type of algorithm, uh, this type of methods uh, depends on some precision parameter. And uh, of course, you can always prove that every type of algorithm, when the precision parameter tends to infinity, so you have infinite precision, then you converge to the true. But the problem is to obtain a uniform estimate with respect to the time parameter, especially in this type of problems. Mm, the main problem in these uh, high dimensional uh, problems in data simulation is that there are some uh, a few effective dimensions, which mean that the signal maybe is high dimensional, but there is only two, three or four effective dimensions in the sense that in these dimensions, the signal is unstable. So if the signal is unstable, is there some algorithm that is uh, able to stabilize these uh, unstable dimensions. Of course, in one dimension, uh, if you allow the signal in one dimension to be unstable, then you need to solve the problem and to show that the ensemble can filter in one dimension, even if the signal is unstable, will stabilize the signal, will stabilize the estimate around the true values. So that's um, the, the, the main object of this talk. Is, uh, is to understand, uh, or at least to show you some tools to show that this ensemble Kanban filter work even if you, you are in one dimension with an unstable signal. So as I said, uh, so I, the, the main tools I'm using uh, all the time are uh, stochastic interpolations. And uh, so that's why I, I wrote here the two links. So if you click on them, you will have the, uh, the, the PDF that we open. So these, I, I think, they are nice tools to, to analyze when you have a system and another one is a perturbation of this one. And the perturbation tends to zero when the precision increase. So there is some nice tool to analyze this type of uh, perturbation. So that's why I put these two things. 
So uh, I will start with some provocative uh, slides. So suppose you have a precision parameter and n increase means the precision of the algorithm tends to infinity. So you have infinite precision, you have a supercomputer. Uh, so this can be the time step, uh, can be the number of samples, the number of particles. And there are a lot of uh, mathematical literature, including mine, with bounds such that you have some estimate like that, an exponential of the time parameter divided by the, the precision parameter. And of course, they look very nice, but if you look, uh, or even of course like that, so you can write the estimate of the following form, but as soon as you take uh, the time parameter equal to 30, you are above 2000 times the number of particles in the visible universe. So in fact, that means that uh, you will need, if you use this estimate to say something, you, you will need to have more particles than the, part, the one you can see in the universe. So that it's impossible to use this type of estimates. So that's why uh, I think it's really important if you analyze an algorithm to obtain something which doesn't depend on the time parameter, especially if you have an unstable dimension and you want to show that you track the unstable dimension, uh, it means that you need to, to ensure that uh, uniformly in time, even if this signal is unstable, you track it uniformly in time. So that's the main uh, objective of this work is to show that it works in, uh, for the ensemble Kalman filter. And let me say that for uh, the particle filter, uh, all the estimates I know are based on ergodic, uh, ergodic properties of the signals. And uh, this doesn't apply to this type of transient and unstable uh, signals. Okay, so uh, first I've started working on this subject in continuous time. So I did a lot of work on this stuff with mainly with uh, Julian Tugo and Alino Kurtzman. And then I was happy with that, but it was for stable signal. And when I met uh, Adrian Bishop in, uh, in Sydney, uh, we discussed on that and he told me, but uh, your, your results are trivial. They are trivial because the signal is uh, stable. So it goes to zero. So if, you're not, if you don't succeed to have uniform estimate in time, it means that your analysis is rubbish. So of course you should just estimate by zero. Of course, you will not, you will not have the precision parameter, but you will have uniform in time estimates. So in fact, that's not, uh, that was not very uh, convincing. So, uh, and we start working with unstable and transient signal with Adrian and uh, Shani. And we did a lot of work on that for continuous time model, including for multivariate uh, models. Uh, so of course, there are a lot of tricks behind that. But the main idea is if you have a continuous time model, then you can write quite easily the evolution equation as the perturbation of the Kalman filter and the perturbation of the Riccati equation. And then because you know all the work on uh, the Kahneman filter on the stability of Kahneman filter and Riccati equations, you can enter this information to obtain uniform estimate with respect to the time. Just let me say a few words on that. The stability uh, theory of Kahneman filters have started in the 70s or 60s with the work of Kahneman, Bussy, and many others. But there were a lot of uh, errors in, the, in, in some proofs. Uh, mainly due to the fact that you are working with matrices, with positive matrices, and it's very easy to make uh, errors when you deal with this type of uh, analysis. So that's why we, we did some uh, work in the beginning to understand correctly, and we did some a kind of review on the stability of Kahneman filters here, uh, which I think is, not, is correct, and there are no... <laughs> no error inside on this one. At least we have not um, uh, duplicate the error made by uh, some authors during this work. So it was not so easy to uh, enter these stability properties into the analysis of the ensemble Kahneman filter, but there is a theory on that and you can use this uh, using this type of stochastic perturbation uh, analysis. 
So let me show you in continuous time how things are pretty nice. Uh, so you start with the continuous time filtering problem, which is linear and Gaussian. So these two guys are, Gaussian, uh, are Brownian motions. And the, the answer, if you want to look at the conditional distribution of the signal, given the observation, you have, again, if you start Gaussian, you always have a Gaussian. With the, with the conditional mean and the conditional covariance, which satisfy the kalman bussy filters. So this is the evolution of the conditional mean. The blue term is called the gain. And the, the matrix PT here is the solution of the Riccati equation, which is written here, where all the time I will write S C prime sigma minus one C sigma is the, 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 the covariance of the noise uh, of the sensors. And this Riccati equation can be solved offline, or you can even use, if you can, the fixed point uh, equation of that. You, let's say the, the, you take the covariance matrix that is, that for which this is equal to zero. So you, 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 you plug this inside here. This is called the steady state Kahneman filter the steady state Kalman filter. And then this can be done offline and you apply that and you have, let's say, a, a nice estimate if the world was uh, with linear Gaussian uh, signal and linear sensors like that. But of course, it's not always like that, but at least in, in this type of model, at least with the simulated data, you will see that it works pretty well. Of course, when you are real data, that's another story. If you apply that and you introduce here real data, uh, and then you try to check, uh, to track the signal, if the signal doesn't come from this type of equation, you may have some troubles, but that's a, another story. So for, lin for continuous time model, you have a very nice uh, expression like that. Uh, stochastic differential equation because uh, the increment of observation is uh, related to some Brownian motion. And here you have a Riccati equation. And these two objects, as I said, are well understood. This converge exponentially fast. Hi, Pierre. Yeah. Uh, so we have a problem. Uh, we don't see the screen anymore. Uh, uh, just give us a second. Does this appear? Oh, okay. So it's just a notification. It start again, it's fine? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay, you can continue. Okay. okay. Sorry for the interruption. It's fine. Uh, so you have here a deterministic dynamical system in matrix spaces that converge exponentially fast to a fixed point. In fact, there are two fixed points. One is positive, one is negative. And if, even if you start at zero, because uh, this will be zero, the R push you, uh, push you on the positive axis. And if you go too far away, the square take you back. So it's quite in, intuitive that this is stable compared to exponentially fast to some fixed point. And then uh, if you plug the fixed point here, you can study the stability of a linear SDE like that, comparing this to the true signal and so on and so on. But at least you have very nice um, uh, object to work with. So the, the idea of ensemble Kanban filter is to look for a, a nonlinear diffusion that depends uh, on the law of the diffusion itself, such that if you look at the conditional distribution of the diffusion, you end up with the Gaussian, with the, with the Kalman filter and the Riccati equation. Okay, so you, you want to define a mackin blasov type diffusion that depends on the law through its covariance matrices. So there are plenty of algorithms for that. This one is called the vanilla ensemble Kalman filter. So for this one, you see that this is a, 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 let's say, a linear diffusion. If A is stable, it's an orchestral lembeck, but otherwise it's a linear diffusion. Uh, this is the, cover, the, the observation. You plug this here. So to sample this diffusion, you simply need to sample this noise, sample this noise. Unfortunately, you need to compute the covariance 
of the law of x bar given the observation. Remember that P eta, eta is the conditional law of the diffusion given the observation, and you need to compute the covariance of this law. So to sample this, you cannot do that because you need to compute the covariance of the law of the states given the observation at every time step. So, but this is a nonlinear linear blasov equation. And if you look at the conditional law of these random states, then uh, you have the Gaussian with the desired covariance and the desired Riccati equation. There is another one, which is called the Sakov and Oak. It's uh, you, instead of sampling this noise that makes something, it, if you sample the noise, it looks like an ABC technique where uh, each particle, you will sample the, the, the sensor noise and compare to the true observation. Uh, so this looks like ABC. Uh, for those who know this uh, approximate Bayesian computation. And the Sakovenox tell us that you can eliminate this noise taking just the state plus its mean, E is the identity function. So that's the mean. So you take the state of the, of the diffusion, you add the mean, you divide by two, you define a new diffusion here. And this new diffusion satisfies the same property you, uh, if you look at the conditional law of the diffusion, it's again a Gaussian with the conditional mean given by the Kahneman filter and the conditional covariance given by the Riccati equation. So there is another one, which is this Sakov and Oak, which has less noise here. Now, if you, there is another one, which is the pure transport uh, equation. This has been introduced, all of these have been introduced in discrete time. And I will tell you something that in discrete time, this one is not consistent and this one is not consistent too. But uh, in continuous time, all of them are consistent. If you look at the pure transport equation, you are not obliged to sample this noise. So it's completely deterministic, as you can see, given the observation. And the, the only randomness comes from the starting point. So uh, these are not null because the starting points are, uh, are different. If you sample different particles with different possibilities and you make the evolution, the, the, the randomness from the start make this non-degenerate. And if you don't have enough particle, you can take here the pseudo inverse and so on. And again, uh, this type of uh, model satisfy the desired property. The conditional law of the state given the observation coincide with the Gaussian with the desired uh, Kahneman filter as the conditional mean and the covariance as the Riccati equation. And there are plenty of any, many other. If you just add this type of term with the skew uh, symmetric matrix like that, it also works. So there are an infinite number of diffusion that works. And all of them, as you can see, to sample them, you need to sample the noises here or to sample the noise or simply do the deterministic evolution. But at each time, you need to, to compute the covariance of the law of the process. So the ensemble Kahneman filter is, as usual, you take, for example, this one, you sample the noise, you sample the noise. This is exactly what is written here. You sample the noise, you sample the noise. And instead of the true covariance, you plug the, the empirical covariance matrix. Okay, so that's instead of computing the sample, the true covariance, you replace the true covariance by the sample covariance matrix. So that's the idea uh, of the ensemble Kalman filter is to start with something which is nonlinear that depends on the covariance of the law. And then you, you, when you use the particle, you replace the covariance of the law by the sample covariance, that's all. So little m is the sample mean, uh, and pt with a little p is the sample covariance. And now if you look uh, where are, of course, the kalman bussy and the Riccati equations, if you look at this, if you look at the evolution of the sample mean, you follow exactly the evolution of the, um, the kalman bussy equation. But here is the sample mean, uh, sample covariance. And you have an extra term, which is the perturbation coming from the sampling of the particles. 
But here you can see that if you have the precision parameter that tends to infinity, this term will disappear. And this is exactly the, the evolution of the Kahneman filter equation, a part that PT is the sample covariance. Okay. So now, of course, this is a vector, is the, the, the sample mean, so it's a vector of states. So this is a vector martingale. And if you take two entries and you multiply them, you don't have a martingale. But if you subtract the, 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 the entry corresponding to this matrix, you obtain a martingale. So that's called the, the angle bracket. What you need to subtract to the martingale to have some, when you take the square, you have the square minus this is again a martingale. And here you can see the difference between the three cases. In the first case, the vanilla, the U and V correspond to the R and S coming from the, the signal covariance and, uh, and the sensor covariance because you sample the noise in the signal and you sample the noise as, as in the ABC in the sensor. So this, as you can see, is there is a square here. So the, the fluctuation of the angle bracket is a square. In the second case, you don't sample the noise in the observation, so V is zero. So that shows you that already in the second case, the, the angle bracket have less fluctuations. And of course, in the third case, because it's a pure transport, you don't have this term, okay? But still, instead of the true Riccati equation, you have the sample covariance. So the idea is to look now at the, the evolution of the sample covariance matrices, and you obtain the evolution of the Riccati equation plus, again, a perturbation. And because PT is a sample covariance, is a matrix with plenty of entries, and if you multiply two entries, then you don't have a martingale again, so you need to subtract an angle bracket. And the formula uh, is given here. This is what you need to subtract to this matrix, such that if you take the square, you obtain again, the square minus this will be a martingale. And here you see that the angle bracket is now uh, of the PT and P square here. So in the third case, in the first case, when V is strictly positive, you have something which is cubic here. And because of that, in one dimension, you can show that this has a heavy tail invariant measure. So that already tells you that if you look at some moments in one dimension of the sample variance, some moments may not exist if you don't have enough particles. So in fact, the number of particles, the, the tail depends on the number of particles. And if you don't have enough uh, particles, some moment may not exist. So that shows you already some problems. But the good news is that in the second case, for the sack of Enoch, when V is zero, you have something which depends only on P, so it's no more cubic. And if you look at the invariant measure, you have something which, which has Gaussian tails. So in that situation, all the moments will exist. So that show you already that uh, the sack of Enoch will be uh, will exhibit less fluctuations than the vanilla ensemble Kahneman filter. So this is more or less the the, the image of that uh, in uh, a short uh, short image of of what has been done in continuous time and the ideas behind the continuous time models. Something to say that if you, if you uh, uh, for IID samples, the sample mean and the sample covariance are independent. This property propagates here in terms of the martingale. In fact, the, the perturbation martingale here and the perturbation martingale of the sample mean are orthogonal. So that simplifies a lot the calculations. Uh, and it corresponds to this idea, even if you have interaction in the middle, the independence properties you have from the start, because the sample mean in the start is independent of the sample covariance in the start, this propagate in, in terms of the martingale, uh, the perturbation martingales. Okay, so that was very nice, but in practice, everything works in, need to work in discrete time. So that's why we start studying the discrete time model. 
So for discrete time model, is there some uniform estimate as we did in continuous time? Uh, is there some stability theory which can be developed as in continuous time? And as I said in the beginning, even for particle filters, I don't know uh, if the particle filter is able to track a transient signal. Uh, and there has been a lot of work in these uh, topics, but one simple question which I've asked to my new PhD student is, uh, let's take a one-dimensional uh, filtering problem uh, and uh, with a, a transient signal, is it possible for the particle filter to track this uh, signal? Okay, so this talk, will give you an answer of the first question, so only this one, the discrete ENKF, for one-dimensional linear Gaussian models. So of course, you can see that there are a lot of research projects which can be developed in this field. So the linear Gaussian discrete in 1D is, as usual, defined by this type of equation. These are parameters. These are IID Gaussians, and you, you need to start with Gaussian, with the Gaussian, with the given mean and a given uh, variance. And here the time parameter is uh, discrete. So again, uh, for linear Gaussian and discrete, you uh, everything, if you start Gaussian, everything will remain Gaussian. And you will have the, the, the conditional law given the observation up to n minus one will be a Gaussian with a given mean and a given variance. The same for the conditional law of the state given all the observation, including the last one, that will be a Gaussian. And the evolution of these uh, parameter, the conditional means, and, and here, are given by the Kahneman filter. So that's known since the 60s. And I would say that it's even known uh, since uh, the 19th, uh, 19th century. Um, because if you look, what is inside is nothing but the regression formula. It's a type of a sequential regression formula. So if you have a pair of Gaussian, the law of one given the second is again a Gaussian. And so that's called the regression formula. So when you update, so when you introduce a new information, that bias formula, which is the regression formula, give you how the conditional mean changes and how the covariance changes. And for you, when you do the prediction, so you simply do that. And here you say, this guy is a Gaussian. What is the law of this guy? Uh, you have a, again a Gaussian with the A times the mean and the covariance is A square, the variance plus B square and, and, uh, and, and one here. So that's quite simple to write the, the Kahneman filter in one dimension. And uh, that's the, the evolution equations, uh, I said. So that's how you update uh, the, the conditional mean. How do you obtain the variance? How you do the prediction? How you do the prediction? So that's quite trivial. So uh, for those who know that, you can check this uh, by hand. Uh, so here, what is important, this is called the gain. So the gain has this form. So in fact, if you look one minus the gain times C, you have a, a, a ratio like that. So that means that this corresponds to a ratio. So you have P divided by that. So if you take A square ratio, you have again a ratio. So that's why if you look at the evolution of the variance here, is given by what is called Riccati rational difference equations. So just because this is a ratio, so if you replace this by this ratio times p, you obtain this type of expression. So you have these Riccati rational difference equations that you can almost solve them and uh, study the convergence of these properties. And you have a lot of uh, properties uh, connected to that and this. So without any approximation, this type of object are rather elementary to analyze, let's say. So that's uh, how we can incorporate the stability properties of this type of object to say something on the ensemble Kalman filter. So that's the, the main objective. So now let's look at, let's come back uh, here. Look at the evolution here of these quantities and you have one, the gain here, is C 
de, de variance, c square variance and d square. Okay? So just remember that the gain has this form. So here, what I'm doing is exactly to take this expression. I just copy this expression. I plug it here, but I add some extra noise here in the sensor. Okay, so this is exactly this expression plus extra noise and G is again of the same form, C, Q, C square, Q, D square as here, C, P, C, C square, P plus D square. So of course it's exactly the same formula. Now, if I look at this evolution here is the same as this one plus an extra noise. Okay, so what I'm writing here is the same expression as before with an extra noise here and an extra noise here. And in here, the gain has exactly the same formula as before. But what I'm doing now is that I'm replacing this Q, which was here correspond to this P. I replace this P by a Q here in the gain definition by a Q. And the Q is the variance of the law of the random state I'm defining by these uh, formulas. So I repeat, this corresponds to a Markov chain with, with here, you are, I'm, I'm taking exactly the same formula as before plus an extra noise. So this define the Markov chain, but the Markov chain depends on some gain, which has the same form as before. And the gain depend on the variance of the law of the random state. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the perfect sampler, but because you can check that the conditional law of the random states coincide with the Gaussian, with the desired mean and the desired variance given by the Kalman filters. Okay, so that is the perfect sampler. If you are, if it's possible to sample this Markov chain, one way you can try is to sample the noise. So that's simple. But at each time step to compute the gain, you need to compute the variance of the law of the state I'm defining by these formulas. So I have a random state, which is not only random because of the observation, but it's random because of the extra noise I'm adding. And if you, you need to compute the law of these random states, such and, and then compute the variance to plug it here to compute the gain and to make the evolution of the Markov chain. Of course, um, here I'm uh, cheating a little because as I said, this is a perfect sampler in the sense that the conditional law of the state coincide with the Kalman filter. If they coincide with the Kalman filter, it means that the, var the variance coincide with the Riccati equation. So in fact, what I'm writing here, this variance of the law is coincide with, with Pn here. So of course, uh, I'm saying that instead of writing Pn, I'm saying that this gain depends not on Pn, but it depends on the variance of the law of the random states. Okay, so that's explain why this is well defined, because in fact this vari this conditional law is a Gaussian with the mean and the variance, and the variance is given by the Riccati equation. So of course I can write it in that way, but in fact this coincides with the Pn. So if I write Pn here. I have no choice. This, this has to be the variance of the conditional law of the random states. Okay, so that's the perfect sampler. And as usual, because so that's the consistency property that tells you that, as I said, the conditional law of the random state I'm defin defining in that way coincide with the uh, with the one step uh, predictor. And if you look at the conditional law 
after the updating, it coincides with the optimal filter. Okay, so that's the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the mathematical way of writing these nonlinear Markov chains. And then to say, okay, I don't know how to sample uh, this type of Markov chain because the gain depends on the variance of the law of the random state. So what I'm doing with the particles is to replace the, is to sample the noise and replace the variance, which is here, by the sample variance. It's always the same trick. But what is interesting here is that if you look, so this corresponds, as you can see, I'm sampling noise here. So it corresponds to the ABC vanilla ensemble Kalman filter in, uh, in continuous time I've discussed previously. So it's tempting to, to use the Sakob Enoch to say, okay, let's take X, add the, the mean and divide by two or even to take the pure transport equation in discrete time. And in fact, these two guys, the Sakov Enoch in discrete time, or the, which is called, uh, okay, it's called in the literature, the deterministic ensemble Kalman filter, uh, but the deterministic ensemble Kalman filter is still random uh, here, huh? but not, it may not be here. Because if you take this plus its mean by two, of course, this is now deterministic given the observation, but still you need to sample the noise in the prediction. So the terminology deterministic for the sakov uh, filter is not so, it's a bit confusing. But anyway, if you just apply the sakov discrete time version or the reich encoder pure transport, they are not consistent. So it means that if you look at the, the conditional law of the random state you are creating or designing in that way, uh, if you look at the conditional law, they will not coincide with the optimal filter, which is given by these Gaussians. Okay. So even if it's tempting to apply the sakov or the deterministic uh, model, uh, just take care because if you look at the conditional law, there will not be the optimal filter. So when you will have infinite precision, you will not converge to the true optimal filter. The sakov and pure transport are only consistent in continuous time. Okay, so as I said, if you want to sample, the to the sample, you just mimic, you just take these formulas, you sample noise. Of course, if you sample the noise, here you, you sample WI, VI, you need to say that's the particle I. So that's what is written here. I sample the noise here, I sample the noise here. So that's the particle after the updating, that's the particle after the prediction. And G is the gain. The gain has the same expression as usual, but instead of the covariance of the law, I'm using the sample covariance. Okay, so that's very simple. Instead of you just sample noise and instead you take the gain expression and instead of the, the covariance of the law, the variance of the law, you take the sample variance. Okay, so it cannot be uh, defined in, in a simpler way. Uh, there is a little rescaling because as usual, uh, when you work with sample variance or sample covariance is the same. If you want an unbiased estimate at time zero, when you have IID sample and you have the sample mean of IID samples, uh, this will be unbiased if you take this uh, factor. So here you have n plus one particle. And if you make n plus one here, which is tempting, you will have a, a, a little bias. So it's better to take one over n as a factor here. And so that explains why you are not take, replacing only the, 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 the law by the empirical law, you are making a little factor in front of it here. So the, just remember, that's not so important. It's important because when you make calculation, if you don't want to have extra term running everywhere, it's better to keep the, 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 the conventional rescaling to avoid the bias, at least in the beginning, and it helps also in the, in the time evolution. So that's a very simple way to define the ensemble Kalman filter in continuous, in discrete time. 
you mimic the equations and that's it. Of course, you can say if it's not linear, but if, if the signal is not linear, you simply add some parentheses here. So you will have instead of A of X, which is an affine function, uh, you take A of X, which is a nonlinear function. And instead of the covariance uh, of the variance, you will take the, 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 the variance, the covariance between the signal and the sensor function. So that's exactly what people do in for nonlinear model. But for nonlinear model, this type of ensemble Kalman filter is not consistent. So that's important also to say. Uh, if you look at this, even in even for linear Gaussian, the Sakov Enoch and the deterministic pure transport are not consistent. And if you apply this type of ideas with, with the sensor function, which is nonlinear, and the signal function, which is nonlinear, of course, you can write the parentheses here and write the parentheses everywhere to make you happy. But at the very end, when you come, you it's not consistent. Okay, so you will not converge to the optimal filter. So the only way to analyze the consistency, or, or at least to understand how it works, is really to work for linear Gaussian model with the vanilla in the case of discrete time models. Okay, so now let's look as we did uh, the evolution equation of the sample mean and the evolution. So I want to look at the evolution equation of the sample mean and the evolution equation of the of the vari of the sample variance, as I did for continuous time model. But before to do that, there is something which is important to see here from the start. Is uh, is uh, in fact okay. I will show you how it works, but the idea is in discrete time that you will have some extra term uh, because of the squares. So here I, it's a very brief reminder on non-central chi-squares. So I, uh, in this slide, zi, zeta i are iid Gaussian n01 centered and uh, unit variance uh, iid Gaussian. So the, the oh, sorry. The, the non-central sky square I define in that way, when you take the, the Gaussian plus some parameter square, you develop, you, will have, you can trust my calculation here, you will have this term which correspond, if these are Gaussian, this is again a Gaussian, and you will have the squares arriving here. So if these squares, you subtract their mean and you divide by the, by the normalization factor. So in that case, this fact, this Z tilde asymptotic is asymptotically Gaussian, will be asymptotically Gaussian independent of that, but before the limit, if they are dependent here. So if you look at this type of expression, you have two random perturbation arriving, this one and this one. In continuous time, this simplify, but in discrete time, they don't simplify. So if I look at the sample variance, because if you look at, so this will be used here because of this square, but I need also the sample variance, the sample, the, the sample mean. So to, to encapsulate the fluctuation of the sample mean, I need, not only to, to work with this type of terms, I also need to work with something which is the same of that, almost the same as this, but with independent, with independent IID equations. So here you see, I take the first one from one to N, and here I take from N plus one to two N plus one. So this guy has the same law as this, it's again a Gaussian, but these two are independent. So I will have one independent, another independent Gaussian, and an extra term, which is of that form, which is asymptotically Gaussian. So if you look at the three terms, these two will be useful to, uh, to, to, uh, to write the fluctuation of the sample variance. And this one will be useful to write the fluctuation of the sample mean. So this useful for the sample mean, because I'm sampling noise in the, sample, in the sample mean. 
And these two will be useful for the fluctuation of the sample variance. And if you look at the three terms, when, when the number of the, the precision parameter tends to infinity, you converge to uh, independent Ga three independent Gaussians. So that's important. If you look at this, this correspond to the sample variance fluctuation. This will correspond to the sample mean uh, fluctuations. And the three guys will converge asymptotically to some Gaussians. So I will use this type of notation with the at for the sample. Let's say this is almost a Gaussian. This has the same form. And there is an extra Z tilde of the following form. OK, so let's apply this expression at the beginning. I, in the beginning, you have II, the sample mean for, of, of IID samples at, at the start. That's their mean. And you, you write here V0, in fact, is this minus this multiplied by this. And you normalize to have something uh, with the mean of the square equal to 1. Uh, so if you this z tilde correspond to exactly the set the term I wrote previously. The same for the sample variance. You can have you have this perturbation formula that tells you that the sample variance is the true variance plus a perturbation, and this term can be written in terms of the z tilde I wrote previously, or the the, the non-central. Uh, chi square, but here is is centered because I take x equal to zero. Remember this: if x equal to zero, you don't have this term. So using this type of notation, z check tilde and at, I already am already able to write the perturbation formula at the beginning. The sample mean is the true plus a perturbation written in terms of z at. The sample variance is the true variance plus the perturbation written in terms of Z tilde. Okay, so that's from the start, how to use this type of perturbations. So you can check this expression, simply V, v naught is the sample mean minus is true mean multiplied by that. And you need to divide by square root of P to, to have something normalized. Okay, so, so this is just to play with notation to say that the sample mean is the true mean plus the perturbation. The sample variance is the true variance plus the perturbation, which are expressed in terms of the function I've defined previously, the, the random variables I have defined previously. Of course, if I want to do that at every time step, I need to define the same object as before, <coughs> but instead of instead of zi, which are iid Gaussian, uh, because I'm sampling noises, and I'm sampling the, the wi, and I'm sampling the vi. So I need to write the corresponding functions, random variable associated to these two guys, when I will take the averages. So this is what I'm doing. I'm defining exactly the same formula as before, but instead of the zi, I choose the vi, and instead of the zi, I choose the wi. Okay, so these two guys are defined as before, but instead of zeta, I'm using the, the, the noise, I'm sampling the vi, and here, I'm, I'm instead of the zi, I'm replacing the zi by the noise I'm sampling uh, in the signal. Okay, so that's exactly the same uh, expression. And thanks to that, so asymptotically, as usual, this becomes IID Gaussian, and this becomes IID Gaussian for the same reason as before. Here, this is already a Gaussian. This is an independent Gaussian. This is not Gaussian, but by the central limit theorem, it becomes asymptotically a Gaussian. So at the end of the day, the three parameters you are defining Two are already Gaussian, and the last one converge to a Gaussian. And when the precision will increase, the three coordinates will become independent Gaussians. I'm doing the same trick if instead of the ZI, I'm, I'm using the, the, the VI or the WI 
which I'm sampling uh, in the ensemble Kanban filter. Okay, so now thanks to these notations, I'm looking at the perturbation theorem, the same as the continuous time. So if you look at the evolution of the updated sample mean, you satisfy the, 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 the Kahneman filter in discrete time plus a perturbation. The same for the sample, the updated variances, they satisfy the same equation as before plus some perturbation. The same for the predicted uh, sample mean and the, and, the, and the sample variances here. You have the same type of uh, equation plus a perturbation. So if you come back to the definition I have here, it's exactly, oops, it's exactly the same formula as I have here, plus a perturbation here and here, and plus a perturbation here and here. So I have exactly the same equation as the Kahneman filter, plus some perturbations. This is what is written here the same evolution of the Kahneman filter plus some perturbations. And of course, to describe this perturbation, they will be defined in terms of the quantities delta I've just defined previously. So uh, for example, I, I will just prove you this one. Here, this is the sample mean when you make the prediction is A the sample mean plus this. So wh why this is delta one? Delta one, remember, delta one is the sample, the average of the noise I'm sampling. Okay, so if you come back here, if you look at the, the prediction, the sample mean is A times the sample mean plus B, the sample mean of the noise. And the sample mean of the noise the sample mean of the noise is here. And that's why you have B, the sample mean of the noise. So in fact, it's not so complicated to write this type of uh, formulas. It's simply you take sample averages and you look what, what, you, what you obtain at the end. So this is the expression of the, of the perturbation terms in terms of the parameter I've defined previously. So remember, these two are sample mean of the, of the, these terms are the sample mean of the noise you are sampling in the observations. And the delta are the sample mean of the noise you are sampling in the signal. So that explains why you have this term uh, which corresponds to the sample mean you are, you are sampling in the, in the observation. They come here. The sample mean you are in the signal are here. The, this corresponds to the first term. What is more complicated to write is the, how uh, this perturbation in, in, in the evolution of the variance. Because here you have the squares to deal with. So you need to write precisely what's going on when you, when you take the average of squares and you obtain this type of expression. So this is not so trivial, but you can check it also work with the parameter I've defined previously. So if you look at this, and uh, because as I said, these two guys are independent, asymptotically independent, you can also look at the evolution of this, only, only the evolution of the variance and you just replace p at by this expression, you will obtain again the, the, the fractional Riccati equation plus a perturbation. And the perturbation will be a square, of course, a square, the perturbation of this, plus this term. Okay, so that's a triviality. You replace p at by this expression. A square, this term, we know is the Riccati differential equation. A squared the perturbation, A squared the perturbation plus this perturbation give you the Riccati difference equation plus a perturbation. And this corresponds to a Markov chain uh, in, for, on positive numbers. And you, uh, we can study, it's not so simple because the perturbation are not IID. They are defined by this a square, this term plus uh, this term. So you take a square times this 
plus uh, this term. So, and, and you obtain the Markov chain, and which can be proved is that there exists a single invariant measure. You can find the Lyapunov function such that the, uh, the Dobroshin ergodic coefficient corresponding to this Lyapunov function is strictly less than one. And you have to, which means that the Markov chain convert, forget exponentially fat its initial condition. So that's quite uh, interesting. It tells you that if you look at the evolution of the variances, you have a Markov chain that converge asymptotically, forget its initial condition and so on, and converge to some invariant measure, which I cannot describe, but uh, there exists only one. Now, if you want to look at the, the stability property of the sample mean. So the stability property of the sample mean is a little more complicated because you, you need, if the signal is unstable, the sample mean will have the, the same instability because the sample mean are mimicking the evolution of the signal. So if the signal is unstable, the sample mean will be unstable. So there is no hope to have something stable. If you look at the sample mean alone, you need to compare the sample mean to the true signal. And if you compare the sample mean to the true signal, you obtain another Markov chain here, which is written like that. So this Markov chain, which is the sample mean minus the value of the signal, evolve like that. So you see that you, you have an extra factor and this extra factor, you need to ensure the stability of these products. So of course, if you have MN, a factor MN minus one plus perturbations, you will have to deal with the product of these terms. And you, the key difficulty in studying the stability and the, cover, and the uniform convergence of the ensemble Kalman filter in dimension one is to show that the product of these factors converge to, uh, to zero exponentially fast. So that's the main difficulty. The key difficulty is only here. Everything be before was pure algebra and some tricks, but the main difficulty in the analysis is to understand the product of these uh, random terms for any coefficient A. A correspond to the, evol the matrix, or let's say the, the, the evolution of the signal. If A is less than one, the signal is stable. If A is larger than one, the signal is unstable because Xn is A times Xn minus one. So of course, if A is less than one, because P is a sample covariance, is a sample variance, so S is positive, P is a sample variance, so this is uh, larger than one. So this is less than the norm of A. So if A is less than one, this product, of course, is exponentially stable. But what is important to show is that if A is 1 million, for example, if A is 1 million, so it's much larger than one, this product, even in this case, is stable, is exponentially decayed to zero. So that's, in fact, is true. Uh, even if the signal is unstable, if A is 10 power 1 million, I don't care, the mean of the product tends to zero exponentially fast. So that's the main difficulty, I repeat, to analyze this type of model. And in fact, it showed that uh, even if the signal is unstable, it corresponds to this effective dimension, this unstable dimension, then the ensemble Kalman filter tracks these unstable dimensions. So, uh, now I present you uh, the result we have obtained. The first one tells you that if you look at the true variance and you look at the, 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 the mean value of the sample variance, this first result tells you that you are under bias. And when you are under bias, a typical uh, answer of a friend of mine in CINE working in data simulation in scientific computing, he told me if it's under bias, it, it, I told him it's under bias. So it, the, the, that means that the mean value of the variance is less than the true. And because you, you uh, he told me but it's not possible because it works. Of course it works, but for other reason, if you are under bias, you may expect that you don't have enough uh, amplitude 
uh, enough, uh, you are not close enough to the true to stabilize the signal if it's unstable. And in fact, you are not so far because we, we, have, we are under bias, but when you have enough particle, uh, it, the, the bias tends to zero uh, proportional to the precision. Uh, and the same if you look at the bias of the sample mean, the bias of the sample mean uh, approximate the true uh, Kalman filter with the uniform estimate like that. And uh, the same for at the level of the variance and at the level of the, uh, if you look at the sample variance against the true Riccati equation, we have uniform estimate with respect to the time parameter with the usual Monte Carlo precision. <coughs> the same for the sample mean. The sample mean estimate the, the, the Kalman filter uniformly in time. So there are plenty of results in, in, in the article. So if you're interested, uh, you can look at that, especially multivariate central limit theorem, which are not so complicated to prove as soon as you have the, the right decomposition. And the right decomposition is exactly coming from this type of expression. Because here we know that this one, two, three, one, two, three, all of these sequence, if you look at the sequence of perturbation, they converge asymptotically to a sequence of independent Gaussian perturbations. So in fact, as soon as you have this perturbation theorem, and you know that the sequence of perturbation converge exponential uh, converge uh, to independent Gaussian uh, random sequences, it's not so difficult to obtain by uh, continuous mapping the, the, the central limit theorem. But the key, I think the most important point was to obtain these exponential decays, which I said here, when you compare the sample mean to the true state of the signal, what is important is to ensure that this Markov chain is stable. That means that the, you need to understand this product of random numbers even if A is way larger than one as 10 power 10, for example. And in, in fact, it works for any A and for, for any parameter A, B, C you can take, you will obtain this type of uniform estimate. So of course, it's open question uh, for the dimension two or dimension three. And the main difficulty again will be to study uh, the, the, of course, it will not be product of, let's say, product of random matrices. Here in dimension one is product of random numbers, but of course, in larger dimension, you will have product of random matrices. And these random matrices are not IID, they are connected to the sample variance. And in multidimensional case, they will be connected to the inverse of sample covariances of interacting particle systems. And up to now, there are no tools to analyze product of uh, dependent through some interaction, uh, random matrices. Okay, so I think uh, I finished my, the, the talk. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Pierre. Any questions uh, from people in Zoom? Okay, if you have any question, you can type or uh, raise your hand. Uh, any questions in the audience? Okay, uh, so we have a question. Uh, no, this is, uh, this is Gustavo, okay. No, it was crystal clear. Um, so I, I have a quick question um, myself. Um, so uh, how difficult is it to, to extend this to 2D? So uh, will it be um, easy to, to, to get to that, to the final line here where you have this product yeah, uh, of random matrices? Um, so is it easy to get to that point? at least i think everything will be easy up to here <laughs> and, uh, then yeah uh, i mean uh, i i would say all of these equations 
they will be easy to obtain. Of course, a little more sophisticated to write and so on. But I, I think we can uh, derive this type of equation in the multivariate case. But at the end of the day, when, when we will compare the sample mean to the true signal, we will need to compare uh, the sample mean to the true signal. And the sample mean is, uh, is here. The, the, the sample mean are here. When you compare to the true signal, it will, uh, you replace m at by this type of expression and so on. And you will obtain this type of formula with the random matrix. And these random matrices, as I said, depends on the sample covariance. And the sample covariance are not, uh, these random matrices will not be IID. Of course, they are result on, uh, on, on product of random matrices when the random matrices are connected by some Markov chain. And uh, if, uh, so this is the multiplicative ergodic theorem. And uh, there is some condition uh, on, on, on the limiting uh, on the limiting matrices because these matrices, let's say, are coming from a Markov chain. So this Markov chain converts to some invariant measure, and you need to study uh, one of one over the time log, uh, which becomes uh, one of the time sum of the log of each. Uh, uh, eigenvalues. Uh, so of course you can write plenty of conditions, but what is important is to show that if this is to, is to connect this condition to, to the choice of the matrix. I will say it should work because in continuous time there were absolutely no problem. The only, the only strong condition we had in continuous time is to have perfect observation. It means that the S or the, the perfect observation means that I'm assuming I'm assuming that C is full rank. Okay. So if I have full rank, uh, I don't care about A, even if A is made strongly unstable, I need to have full rank here so that uh, if you compare what, what is important here, if you look at this, in fact, what is M here? You, if you yeah. put M together, you have A uh, minus P S, C prime sigma minus one C, as I said in the start, yeah, that's S. is S, yes. So if you compare this, uh, which is here the same, A minus P S, is the analog. If this is correspond to a linear model. And if you look, what, what is the matrix in front is A minus PS. The A here minus yes. PS. So in fact, the only uh, possibility for the guy to be stable is that the A minus PS is stable, is a stable matrix. Yes. Uh, and uh, if you are deterministic, if, if you look at the deterministic uh, case, so in fact, A minus PS with the true Riccati equation. So if you look at the true here, you have A minus the true P times S. And this is the, 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 the cornerstone of the stability theory of, of Kalman filter is the stability properties of this A minus PS. And in fact, P, if you, if instead of P, you take the steady state, we know that A minus steady state time S is stable. It's Urvich matrix. So A minus steady state time S, Urvich, this is a key result in the stability of the Kalman filter. And here, what we try to do is to extend this result to interact to instead of the true P to A minus PS with the sample variance or the sample covariance. And so that was the main uh, difficulty in continuous time. And in discrete time, it's even, I don't know how to do that. 
because in continuous time, I have used really continuous time uh, tools to analyze this type of tricks. And uh, so that's why we start in dimension one. Uh, hopefully, the multidimensional case, I'm not working on that nowadays, but if you are interested, you are welcome. We can discuss on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, make the ensemble kind of independent. Uh, so the so the variance doesn't depend on, or let's say, so you don't have uh, dependent uh, samples by, um, um, uh, you know, um, as I said, making making the samples independent by by considering maybe the ink, the the Kalman uh, filter equation of uh, the mean um, evolution, uh, and and by that by the, by doing that, then you'll have matrices that are uh, independent. But still, I mean, you will have the sample sample variances somewhere, no? How you you will make these guys independent? Um, because the p will always be sample variances or sample covariances. I, I will have to think about that because um, I think we use some kind of trick like this in one of our papers uh, with AJ. Um, I'll have to look at that and. Anyway, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Pierre again. So thanks, Pierre, for the nice uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, I apologize, we went over time. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. That's fine. All right, uh, thanks again, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Ciao. Oh, bye.